On today's Locked on Thunder podcast, we're going to talk about Chet Holmgren going on Paul George's podcast. Plus, who are the dark horses for the NBA awards to win the NBA championship and out west with Oklahoma City? You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast. On the Locked On Podcast Network, it's your teams every day. I am your host, media member, and beat writer for InsideTheThunder.com, Sports Illustrated Thunder. Go on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles to find me over there. Joined today by Joel Lorenzi of The Oklahoman, the beat writer over there at JX Lorenzi on Twitter. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Check out the Game Time app, create your account, use code LockedOnNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms and conditions do apply. Joel, how are you doing today on this fine summer day? It's not really day anymore, but that's always a pleasure, Ronnie. Mean, you know what it is, man. We back. It's the theater of the mind, Joel. They have no idea when we're recording this. We could be recording yeah, this yeah. on Mars, and they wouldn't know. Yeah, I mean, them. your green screen is very Mars. You're just out of this world. Hey, listen, that, that's a, a pleasure that you noticed that. But, Joel... Uh, we have a lot to get to today, shockingly enough, as we're in the middle of the worst uh, part of the NBA calendar as you bite down a protein bar. I'm so glad that that's not distracting at all for the listeners. Um, Joel, Chet Holmgren went on Paul George's podcast. I mean, you just can't make 30 minutes without a protein bar. Um, and he was discussing all things off season, all things last season, from singing in a commercial to his non-beef beef with Victor Wimanyama. Is there anything that you took away from Chet Holmgren's podcast P appearance? Right. Well, one, I think these podcasts are so full of nonsense, man. Um, so full of jargon and so full of, uh, like, they're just up to the brim with, like, stuff. If you follow the team all year, and this is with most players, there's no new information with these things. Now, I thought there was one thing that stood out, and I think we would have eventually found this out, but we haven't really talked to Chet like that this summer, so we hadn't known. But um, he was pretty transparent about, you know, all his life trying to draw out bigs, um, and now, you know, what he faced last year in terms of, you know, being cross-matched the way teams strategically did that between, you know, him killing bigs and, and Josh Giddy, you know, playing alongside him, just the combination. Um you know, acknowledging that and acknowledging, you know, what it's going to take now. And now he's worked on, you know, killing smalls now. Like, that's obviously an important part for his leap, for for who he has to be, um, especially during the regular season. Because, I mean, he he saw that early last year. And so um, I thought that was interesting that he pointed out and he acknowledged it. That's been part of his summer. Because, you know, Lord knows we've seen all the – him him going into open court. I mean, we we going to see all that uh, on Twitter with my guy, Swiss Cultures. Like, that's, that's what's going to be – that's what our brains are going to be fed, right? But but this is the, the nitty-gritty, the actual things he probably has to improve. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. And and uh, it was a, a needle in a haystack comparatively, I mean, with all the, you know, the the information we already knew that came from that podcast. So Yeah, I mean, I think that that was the biggest takeaway for sure. I, I think that we haven't gotten that from Chet yet, but it's a topic that we've discussed on this show uh, dating back to May, whenever we were discussing this year in review and discussing what the next steps are. And we both came to the same conclusion that the next step for Chet uh, is being able to exploit those mismatches and being able to shoot over the top of guys, feeling more feeling more comfortable to uh, take a shot, you know, that, that might be quote-unquote contested, but for him and his frame and his ability uh, is a shot that you, you really like, go over hunting uh, a great wide-open shot for somebody else. And so becoming more comfortable, with the uncomfortable becoming, uh, you know, more assertive will be good for him as well. And I think that that's an area where you can see an uptick in offensive production is is him becoming a guy who is no longer um, looking first to pass, but is now incorporating himself as what he rightfully is on the totem pole of one of the big three on this roster and being able to uh, take the the amount of shots that goes along with that. And if if he can take a step forward in that area. This offense that was already top five in the NBA gets even more lethal because it gets more translatable to the postseason. I mean, and in the postseason, 
it's a star driven league. And you saw that last year, you saw that Shea was ready to take you there, but J dub wasn't and Chet wasn't. And that's okay. It was their first time at the rodeo, but in the coming years, they're going to have to step into that mold. And it's, it's a bet that the organization is making on those two guys that I think is a good bet. I think that they will step into that, but to do that, Chet has to be able to take advantage of smaller matchups. No doubt. I mean, we, we, we talked about this all along. Um, and it, I think it's part of why, you know, we'll talk about this later. Um, I think there are just more visible skills that Chet could take a leap with that would make him a candidate for most improved compared to a guy like, like J-Dub. I mean, we'll talk about a bunch of candidates later on, but um, I think there are real visible leaps because that's, that's what people – like that's that's what comes these awards come down to, right? Is the, the visible skills, the actual leaps you can see instead of you know picking through numbers and stuff like that. I think he has visible skills that can be worked on, and that goes with you know uh inverted pick and roll, stuff like that, like all the stuff you could maybe see from him next year that, that people say, like, damn, okay, like he's a he's a player. So yeah, he's gonna be a, a player that I think blossoms into an all-star caliber guy. I think that J Dub will be an all-star caliber guy. It's tough to get three all-stars on the same team. I mean, no matter how good you are, that's a tough feat to accomplish. But um, they're going to be in those discussions, I think, starting this year and, and all the way through uh, the rest of their careers. And they'll make a few all-star teams, of course. And I think those two guys have a ceiling that we're not even really sure um, you know, where it's at right now. We don't really know where they cap out at because of, of what you know they were somewhat limited by last year with the, the awkwardness of the Josh Giddy lineup and – just being so young in their career that if they're already this good, it's tough to even project out what, what they'll be. I mean, you look at Shea as a guy who every year along the way of his NBA career, we all tried to limit. Like we all tried to say, well, you know, now he's a fringe all-star. This is probably the best it gets. Well, now he's an all-star. This is probably the best it gets. And every single year he's taken a step forward. He's gotten better. And so you just have to let the, these things play out. And I think that the, the organization is banking on that development and it's a smart bet uh, for Oklahoma City. Uh, something I thought was very interesting um, was, of course, the way that the players talk about the Josh Giddy trade. Um, we knew this from just their their reaction on social media, from their reaction at exit interviews. But like, there's there's a I think mutual understanding of you know the fact that this is good for both sides. Like the, the Thunder got a really good player, and that Josh got to go to a destination um, where uh, he'll have a better opportunity in Chicago. But just like if one of your best friends at your job leaves, of course you're going to be sad about that. You're going to miss um, what, what they provided for you, both emotionally and both with your work and everything else. But uh, him being hurt by the Josh Giddey trade, I think, is more of the human side uh, than the basketball side. And then his ability to speak, speak glowingly about the Hartenstein addition and, again, confirming what we already knew um, about his, his identity as a player of he's just going to go out there and play whatever they tell me to play, if that's the four, if that's the five, um, he's he's remained firm in that, of no preference of um, wanting to do what's best for the team. Uh, that was, you know, something that we already knew. And he highlighted, uh, you know, how good Mark is, is like the last bit of news from this, uh, from this podcast. Uh, they were talking about, uh, jokingly, <laughs> about who's going to take the last shot between, you know, Joel Embiid and PG. And, you know, PG deflected and talked about how that's a Nick Nurse conversation. And lost in that a little bit is like what Chet points out of, you know, he's also been in that spot. Like he he hit a massive shot in Golden State. You have Shea as a guy who's going to be the go-to guy. But this is a team that also draws up a game-winning play for Aaron Wiggins. And it's something that you don't expect. It's something that throws your opponent off and the, and the um, uh, you know, Allusion, you know, allusions to the the unselfishness of this roster to be able to have that happen, I think, is what ties this team together. But other than that, not much meat on the podcast. P bone here. I will say the one quote that stood out to me. I don't. This is not verbatim. He said something like he got asked, but like uh, along the lines of what you said, the four or five thing. He said that you know guys will say, "Oh, that's not my role. It's not who I am." He said something like like expletive. You are who who you have to be on the floor. You have to mold to that. I thought I thought those was one as a fascinating quote from some of his age. But it, honestly, I mean, we can't really be too surprised anymore. These, these guys are full of those. But you're, you're right. It wasn't a, a super newsy podcast. I mean, I have I have beef with these podcasts. Not I don't have beef with PG. I don't know that I have beef with every player that starts a podcast. But it is such a 
it's such an oversaturated market, man. And these guys, they're playing throughout the year, so they don't know. Like, a lot of these questions are being answered throughout the year, or they're just being answered if you watch these guys. Um, or they're being answered a week before your podcast when they're on the, the other podcast with – another retired NBA player or a, a guy who's in his off season. Like there's just so many of these podcasts, these guys are answering the same questions every week. It's like, what, what are we, what are we gaining uh, from these? If it's, if it's really, we're walking away with two quotes we never heard. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that kind of comes with the territory of one, just the interview format and how much access we have to these guys. Like we have, we have the access to them in their personal life of, of however much they want to give us on social media. We have the, the access to them of their contractual obligations to talk to us as much as they do after every single game. So bare minimum 82 games, they talk to us. Um, and then practices, shoot arounds, preseason games, playoff you know, availabilities, whatever. Uh, and, and so of course you're going to get repetitive questions. You're going to get situations where uh, it's unavailable or unavoidable. And then like you mentioned, there's so many player podcasts, but like these things take time to you know, film, edit. And most of the time you just go through this car wash of, you know, we might not see it hit YouTube until the same, you know, two week stretch, but these were recorded like probably in the same day or the, or, or, or the next day. And like the other podcast yeah, host doesn't know what was going on in that time. And they just happen to get their podcast first to market. Um, and, and so I think that that matters as well of um, not really knowing the timing of that. My issue with the player podcast isn't even necessarily the interview format. And I think that like podcasts are great. I obviously host one. I hope that you, um, you know, listen to lockdown thunder and, and, and love podcasting. Um, but the issue I think is like whenever fans, especially just start to mix, like what, what they're, they are saying as the entire truth, because like, if you really listen to stories and, it, and it's more prevalent now that there's more current players podcasting and like, they're telling the stories that you can remember yourself firsthand of what, what actually happened. There, there's some key details that are wrong or flat out missing in there that change the way that you that you can perceive that story here in 10 years when we forget those details, even down to like when a trade happened, like what day it happened on, what what calendar of the what part of the calendar it happened on. Oh, you mean like, you mean when guests come on there and start capping and start like re yeah, I mean, re it, it rewriting with, history, you mean like, rewriting you know, yeah. history of like yeah. that's where we lose some of this like new you got an example. Great. I have a few. <laughs> New media is great. Like I, I love the players telling their story in a, in a way that um, is comfortable to them. Uh, but there's also a role for Joel Lorenzi to, to tell your story of, hey, let's let's get this right by all accounts, not not just one account of your firsthand experience. Let's right. talk to people who are there, because there's a lot of sides to every story, and I can tell you stories about my life that I vividly remember and honest to God think are, are the way things happen. But you go talk to my parents, you go talk to my sister, you go talk to people involved in the story. And there's, there's little details that you might forget or sequencing that you might forget. But if you've only heard my side of it, then, then I, get to, I get to determine the messaging of what yeah. that side is. And right. that's where I think that we can lose, lose the force through the trees of you know, players are only going on players' podcast or players only telling their stories on their own podcast. Of That's great, but there's also a big responsibility that comes with that. And if you, if you really want to preserve the accurate history and accounting of stuff that happens. And, and so that's not... Like I know this is starting to sound like a tangent. That's not that's not me taking a dump on player podcast. I do think the market is oversaturated. I think I think Paul George is among the leaders of the entertaining ones. Like I think that podcast does a good job. That's it's it's less me dumping uh taking a dump on you know player pods and the market and more so us saying hey, shout out local journalism man because you probably heard a lot of these things over and over throughout the year. I mean we asked chat about Wemby over and over till he was probably couldn't even stand to look at us anymore. He couldn't even, as soon as he heard, he, could, he couldn't stand a syllable. He didn't want to hear it ever again. But of course, you know, the energy is different on these player podcasts and, and these guys. Yeah, and that's, gonna, that's the reality of it. It's a, it's a more comfortable place to be asked about it and a, 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 a bigger format uh, and better format, honestly, uh, of um, in a practice scrum, it's awkward. I mean, frankly, you're, you're just kind of all standing around huddled around this player and they feel like they need to be at least some level of con concise and, and, and some level of uh, brevity to it. Whereas on a podcast, you can talk for an hour and a half and it doesn't really matter. Like you, you can really um, express yourself in, in a more detailed way and express yourself to somebody you're more comfortable with. Like, like uh, I think that that just comes with the, the naturality of communication. 
where like he's more comfortable with Paul George than he is Joel Lorenzi. That's just the bottom line. And, and I think that from, from the standpoint of um, we already know it because we're there every single day. Like you and I are at Thunder Iron every single day. The, 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 the fact is the, the, the people who read our practice reports and our Twitter account uh, pale in comparison to who will listen to a Paul George podcast if they see their favorite player on it. Because like that, that takes looking at Twitter at noon on a Wednesday in January. This takes, hey, this is the one time a year that Chet's on Paul George's podcast. What's he saying? And I've heard now all this information that I don't look at during my lunch break in January whenever we're asking Chet about Wimby. So I just think that from that standpoint, uh, there is a, a difference in, in, in player podcasts. But I think that the only thing that player podcasts fail in is if it becomes, this is the only way to tell your story and this is the only way to um, document history which I think can go down a slippery slope. They're like, if that's the way we want to do it, you know, it's their story to tell however they want to tell it. But I think that like, it can be more accurate um, with someone who you know, has, has uh, all parties involved in it. But the, the player interview format is, is difficult. It's difficult to do any interview, period. Um, and especially to do fresh interview content. Whenever nothing fresh has really happened uh, from the last time we talked to Chet to now, I mean, he's, he's done a, a camp and he's, and he's, um, worked on his game this off season, but not much has changed from an interview standpoint. Uh, so you'd really have to kind of unturn all the stones. I do think that there's an element too of like, they could be a little bit more prepared of just like, because they have so many teammates around them. So to say, right. they, like they don't, they don't have a researcher on site. It's like, have a read on about what, what, on what staff they have. Be. And, and, and I'll say this. I imagine there's some podcasts where, the researcher is like, okay, I've I've read what's out there about Chet and Wimby. We still want Paul George himself to poke the bear because, like you said, it is a more relaxed setting. He's more comfortable with Paul George. We want to see what Paul George can elicit from Chet on Wimby because maybe he talks differently about Wimby than anybody else. But I think, I mean, the book is closed on, on Chet and Wimby, man. I don't know. I, I think they're just – they're just yeah. hyper competitive, man. I don't think that's so so difficult to believe. And not yeah, like that and, was the and question and that pissed true. me off, but I I I, I, did, I do think that's the one that everybody wants to excessively ask. Yeah, and I and I think it's true that like it, that specific example is is one where I think the player podcasts are a, a benefit to journalism because like Chet didn't Chet didn't go for it. Um, he 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 kept a he kept a consistent line about Chet about, about Wimby and, and his play on the court uh, but not every player is like chet where like if if they're asked by someone that, that they're more comfortable with they'll give a totally different answer than if they're asked by joe schmo and a media scrum and so i think that that does help us like in the at the end of the day had chet veered off course and, and given a different answer we would have loved it because like that's a that's a new side so it, it, it can work hand in hand together of, of like what we're trying to do and what player pods are doing so i I, I just think that it's it's going to be fun to see how media as a whole changes and 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 shifts and shifts and uh, shakes throughout the next few years and for the next few years of our lives, Joel. These are the days of our lives. Yeah, they're changing and, before us. And it's, they're soon to be grim. I'll tell you that. But okay, do you have a do you have a favorite player podcast? I would say Paul George's. I, I think that Paul George does a fantastic job in general. Like if I if I was building a a podcast company. Um, and I would look at Draymond, I'd look at Paul George, look at Trey Young, and and Jeff Teague is really good. I, I would start the list with Paul George. Jeff and, Teague and, is for a little bit of a different audience. All these these all these podcasts have different audiences. I certainly have a least favorite one, but go ahead. Uh, Paul George is my favorite one. I, I think Paul what's, what's, really the, what's the least favorite? Uh I could tell you mine. Uh, let's just say that that he had a cool nickname in Washington. I, I think we're on the same page here. Yeah, yeah, we're on the same. Uh, <laughs> we're on the same page here, bro. And no shade, he was a really good player. But man, at podcast, I think it's the audience that it, it draws, man. And, and that's you know, the same thing for every form of podcast. The, the, the conversations that come from that podcast, I think, I, I lose brain cells, man. I really do. But uh, there are people who hate our guts, Joel. So it's kind of like it's the pot calling the kettle black of like. Hey, and the, and no you reap what you sow, I guess. Does that apply here? You reap what you sow? I don't you're, know. Hey, you're the you're the Shakespearean uh, author, so you tell me. But uh, no podcast for everyone. I hope that this podcast is for you. Let's leave it at that and discuss dark horses around the NBA for for massive topics. 
Joel Lorenzi, it's game time. Go download the game time app, create your account today. And when you do, Joel, and you use code Lockdown NBA, guess what? Guess what I'm going to do for you? $20 off your first purchase. That's right. $20 off your first purchase. Terms and conditions apply. Create your account. Use code Lockdown NBA, L O C K E D O N N B A, for $20 off your first purchase. When you download the game time app today, last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. I love game time. One reason I love game time is I love the all in pricing. You just get everything up front. There's no hidden fees. There's no surprises at checkout. What you see is what you pay when you're picking out your seat. I also love the view from your seat because sometimes you've never sat in that area of, you know, of the arena. You never sat in that area of the venue. You've never even been to the venue. You can get the view from your seat at game time. Go there right now. Use code locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Joel, if you're thinking of taking your special someone to a OKC Dodgers game, go check out game time. Create your code locked on NBA. You might need four tickets. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast and the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Joel, how are you doing today? Still feeling good? Yeah, funny for that rhyme before the before the break. You're hilarious. I don't know who you think you are. You think you're a rapper now. That was funny, but I'm good, always. I'm the most versatile on the beach, Well, they've often said that. But you're the, you're the most what? Versatile. Who said that? Uh sources. sources. You you're like you're like on a player podcast right now. I, I, I would challenge you, Joel. I'll say it. Find me the guy whose playlist can go from the Grateful Dead to Elvis to Hurricane Chris. Hurricane Chris is the only rapper you have in your phone. No, that's not true. One of them's canceled. I'm not going to say who it is. Uh, but Chance the Rapper? Chance the Rapper hasn't cool. been good in 10 years. K-Dot? Come on. Chance the Rapper Slater is not tolerated on lockdown. What do you have? Country. The Kendrick single that everybody's been listening to this summer? Give me a break. Okay. No, and not just that one. The Pimple Butterfly. Shout out. Listen, Joel, that's been that's been an anthem of Joel Lorenzi this summer, but that's for another podcast. Joel, <laughs> dark horses for MIP. You look at the MIP listing, and you have a gripe with this, but then again, what doesn't Joel Lorenzi have a gripe read, with? Read off, read off the favorites. Or I'm read going off the to. Odds if, from if, one if you let to me get there. This 10. is why Joel gets in some, some trouble. He has a beef with everything. He hates everything, and he jumps the gun. Joel, MIP favorites. Victor Wimbanyama. Evan Mobley, Jonathan Kaminga, Josh Giddy, Jalen Johnson, Paulo Bencaro, and J Dub. The first Thunder player checks in at plus two thousand. Chet Holmgren, who we talked about making a step forward in the first segment, is at plus six thousand to win Most Improved Player. Mm-hmm. But your gripe comes at the top, and Victor Wembanyama at plus eight fifty to win Most Improved Player. I mean, I get it. It's the way this award works. We, we, I don't want to change to this. It's, it's kind of been like this for some time. It, 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 this, this wins it most years, but we, you know, we reward second year leaps when this is like natural progression. Like this is what we expect these guys to be like when John Morant got it. I don't remember who he wanted uh, over that year, but I was appalled the year he won it. Cause I thought there was a pretty deserving person. Like I know every year there's not going to be a Kobe white or somebody who, who magically pops off in year six, usually by year five or whatever. You kind of are who you are unless your context changes, your, your scenery changes. Um, but like the year two stuff, like, and, 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 and for somebody like Wemby, like who we know is like probably on goat trajectory or somebody like John Moran, who we saw was a great, great, great rookie and was bound to be a great, great, great sophomore. Uh, I just think we reward guys for like not having – sophomore slumps um i i do think for my dark horse i, I mean I, I, we we could each make a case for chet holmgren at plus six thousand. like that's that's as dark as the horse can be but jalen johnson jalen johnson i like his odds i like the way he's trending as a player i like the way he's finding himself in the league um he's like a great 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 modern four really bouncy um great next to trey young um, I don't see why, and I, I imagine Atlanta values him too much for him to change scenery, but I think he'll be great for Atlanta, whatever they're heading toward, and maybe the middle of the pack, whatever. Um, but I think here at his next stop, 
I think he's going to be such a versatile player and have a, a long career. I like who he's becoming as a player. Um, and I think he's due for a real, like, tangible, like, numbers jump. Yeah, and I think that Jalen Johnson is a good pick. Um, Chet, we, we, of course, already made the argument for it, it feels like, in the first segment. J-Dub, you know, uh, I think he's a case. I think, like you mentioned, though, the, the way J-Dub gets better will be recognizable on Lockdown Thunder. It'll be recognizable to you listening. If you're listening to this podcast in August and you survive the the, the player pod discussion, uh, it, it'll be recognizable to you because you've seen this team play and you're very familiar with this team. I, I don't know how evident it'll be in the box score, which is honestly what voters are sifting through um, to to you know name this award. I will say, I look at Josh Giddy and think, you know, he, he peaked in OKC in 22-23 with 16 points per game, 7.9 rebounds per game, and six assists per game. He could have the counting stats in Chicago, and I think you'll have fantastic counting stats in Chicago. What, what what what's the leap it would take then for for him in Chicago numerically? That, that's the question. Is like is like his counting stats have already kind of been there. So like to to make a jarring leap where you look at his basketball reference page and you're trying to vote and you're saying, well, you know, Josh got a lot better. His his counting stats have been 12, 16, 12 in terms of points, seven, seven, six in terms of rebound, and six, six, four in terms of assists. So his counting stats have already been good. Like they've like. To, to, to make a noticeable leap in the counting set department, you need 20 points. You need a 10 in one of the rebound or assist categories, which he could maybe get um, in either one of those categories. And you might need close to 10 in the other one as well. So, like, I, I just – I think that Josh Giddy's odds are a little inflated, be, not because of anything wrong he's doing, but because, like, the way we've done this stuff is going to be counting stats, and he's gotten really good counting stats in the past. Um, but – Plus fourteen hundred, I wouldn't hate it. He's with Billy Donovan, who's gotten the best out of guards. He's in he's in a an avenue where he's able to play the way he's designed to play now, and I think he's going to be great in Chicago. I think he'll be awesome for the Bulls. But I like your pick of Jalen Johnson. I like J Dub. Like if, if J Dub has a healthy year, like he doesn't step on the camera guy, and he continues to thrive in the mid range and and takes any step forward, you could see him average, you know, twenty plus points and eight plus rebounds and five assists with a more open floor without Josh on the floor. No offense to Giddy. Like, I, I think that Josh is, a, I mean, uh, Jalen's a really good pick. And then from there, a shot in the dark, you can really make the case for a billion guys. I'm still not off the Jalen Green train. I'll say it. I know that everybody hates the Rockets, and we've given the Rockets a lot of love in this pot, it feels like. But I'm still not off the Jalen Green hype train. Uh, I will believe in him till the days are gone. Uh, but MIP, I just really want to get your thoughts on would you wager on J Dub or Chet for this award? Um, probably Chet because of the visible stuff we talked about in the first segment. And I also don't know. I think Dub's gonna have a great year. I think he's gonna have a very important year for them. I think he's gonna improve in all the places he needs to improve to have a better second round, have a better postseason run, all that good stuff. Now, there's some things that might and I don't know how well he can just improve his handle in a year. I mean handles are like very that's not, i don't i don't know like that's linear but i don't know that you can make that jump so quickly as other things um that's something i think has obstructed him at least from afar but um like the counting stat i don't know that i agree that he can make the counting stats leap like obviously there's there's a lot more room to be efficient now to get he's going um there are, there's there's more usage for him. Like there are factors that will contribute to him. Certainly having more shots than he did last year. I think the second unit he'll lead potentially um if the Thunder leans in say, you know, a lineup with like dub, um, I'd say either like Caruso or Case and Wallace is interchangeable. Isaiah Joe, whoever one you put at the four, and then like iHeart. I think that he could do great things in that lineup among you know the rest of the game. You know, he comes alive in the fourth quarter. I think he's going to have a great year, but I don't know that he'll have the kind of leap that makes voters. I, I, I think a lot of things, just how well-rounded this group will be, will work probably against this group in some award cases. I don't think that would be the case for Shea because, you know, Shea is the engine. Um, what he does is, is evergreen. He's the most consistent dude on earth. That won't change. But like I just don't know that I see the counter leap, the, the uh, counter stats leap the way you do 
with Doug. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that I would not put money down on MIP because it's just such a it's just such a fool's errand to try to predict who's going to make that leap. Yeah, but, I, I, I will say I, I'll put money on a uh, Cooper Flag his second year. I bet you I bet you he's the favorite. That's just how this award works. That's, that's good true. money. That's true. But if you're going to throw any shekels down, why not put ten on Chet Holmgren? Because if you put ten down on Chet Holmgren at our good friends over at Fanduel, and he wins it. You get 600 bucks for wagering 10. If you're into that sort of thing, uh, maybe maybe a pro tip there. Let's talk dark horses because everyone figures the Thunder are favorites out West and that they are on a collision course with Boston for the title. Dark horses in both categories coming up. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast and the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen. Every single morning, every single day, we're here for you. Talking Thunder Basketball. Here with Joel Lorenzi at JX Lorenzi on Twitter, the Oklahoman beat writer. Joel, we've had a lot of discussion over the last offseason, you know, this summer, about the Thunder and the favorites out West and who could be threats to them. They're still, as we sit here in August, just months away from the season and, you know, a little over a month from media day, they're still the favorites to win the conference. The Thunder at plus 300 to win the West. Who is the dark horse that you could realistically see winning the Western Conference? Well, if the F- if our FBI agents listen to us as often as advertised and they know the answer, if anybody listens to your pod, I, I imagine they know the answer. For me, it's the Grizzlies. I mean, the Grizzlies, obviously, it's been a couple years since they had real momentum. They had some untimely injuries and you know what last year was it, was? it was a disaster on that front, um, and so they have some some time to make up for some 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 lost time to make up for, and some some you know wrinkles to iron, particularly at the the five. I mean, I believe in. I'm like, but I'm behind Edie now. Like, I I'm on the Edie train. I think he's going to be helpful to them, but as a starting caliber center, I think there there are some they have some things to answer. Um, Jaron Jackson is not that right. And so um, there are some things to answer relative to other playoff teams. Uh, but I mean, John Moran is electric. We saw, I mean, how many games did he play last year? Nine when he came back, it was like he never left. I mean, he's, he's given uh Wimby welcome to the league moments. Um, he's getting downhill as well as anybody. He's winning games. Uh, he's winning, he's winning games in the final moments of a game. Um, uh, He's just as, as, you know, I mean, I I, I don't think he's going to steal any hype from Ant Edwards. Ant Edwards is his own phenomenon. I mean, that guy's been compared to Michael Jordan maybe more than anybody in the modern era, um, save for Bron. But, like, John Morant is special, bro. And I don't know that I was always a John Morant fan, but he's special. I think he'll remind people this year. Um, Desmond Bain is an interesting second option. But their their regular season mojo works. Like what they do in the regular season works, um, and I don't I don't think that can't be the case this year. And I think I, I like I, I imagine this is not a unpopular opinion anymore. But Zach Eady is going to be like really helpful. I mean, if that's the guy, if they're getting into drag chains with him all the time because he is going to take some time getting up the floor. Uh, if that's who's setting the screens for Ja, like. You're, you're changing some things here. I, I I like them a lot. I know you do. So, yeah, I mean, we've done multiple Memphis pods. We've done a Memphis pod together. I've done a Memphis pod many a time post Memphis, but to shake it up a little bit, I have a couple more dark horses. Number one is not a dark horse at all, but like Dallas is not talked about as they should be right now. And I don't know when the pendulum will swing back to them, yeah. but they're currently the second best odds to win the West. And, you know, our good pal Derek Parker is out on Dallas, as he said on, yeah. on last week's you, show. You never uh, know it by the way they get talked about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm in on Dallas. I'm in on Dallas. Uh, but we'll talk more about that. I think that the Thunder are the are the clear-cut favorites. Vegas has it as such. Eye test has it as such. Production has it as such. Roster talent has it as such. Like, they're the clear-cut favorites. Dark horses, though, I mean, technically, Minnesota at plus 500, but we all know what Minnesota, Denver, Dallas is about. The Tyus Jones pickup in Phoenix, if they get there healthy and they have Jones, 
Rant, Booker, Beal. Would it shock you if they go on this miraculous run? If, if they go on a Dallas-like run, would that just stun you? The role players have have Dallas-like run series. to the finals. Would it would, would it shock you if 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 a yeah, it would. That was what that's what that reaction was. Shock. A nucleus of Tyus Jones, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, fully healthy. Getting getting help from their rotation makes a run. It's they're hot. Fine. They're fine. Relative to the Western Conference, they're fine. I wouldn't I wouldn't count them out of the playoff picture. I don't think they're dead in the water they were in that Minnesota series. Maybe they win a couple more games in the series. They stand a chance. I think I think part of their outlook for people in the immediate future weighs so heavily on their outlook over the next, like whatever this window is for them, like obviously because that's so grim. People want to be out on them now, and you know whether they can win a series. I think they they're they're in, they're better situated than they were last year. They got a couple actual point guards now, and Tyus Jones is a really really good player. Um, but they're fine. I mean, uh, Dallas like run. What are you talking about here, man? I know you. I know we talking about dark horses, but Jesus Christ, we're talking bro. about dark horses. We're talking about dark uh, horses. Dallas we're like run is deep. crazy. Dallas like run is crazy. You gotta dig deep. I, I would. Mean, I would. Not only would I be shocked, I might go but, into but cardiac was arrest. Dallas better than Oklahoma City last year by any metric? No, they were better in that series, and they and they had and they had the better uh, star power in that series. You're telling me that there's no path where Phoenix just out star powers you, where Phoenix gets the help necessary from Grayson Allen and them boys. I think Dallas matched up well with Minnesota, so that once the Thunder was out the way, they had the path to the finals. Is 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 Phoenix going to have matchups like that three times in a row? And that's the, that's the issue. That's why there are dark horses because they know there's no evident matchup where they where they have success. They're going to need help for this for this to pay off and them actually being a dark horse. They need help, and that's what help makes from the, the injury dark gods. Well, it's not going to be the biggest, basketball. That's their biggest help. Well, you know, I know. I know. I know. I know. I'm, I don't just mean they're on their team. I mean they're gonna need help from the injury guys on the teams they're playing. It's it's gonna take that. Now I I'm I, listen, I, I, we're all I'm a bud, I'm a bud believer though. Every I'm, single one of us is day to day. And all I can tell you is if that day comes and judgment day is around the corner and at the pearly gate stand Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, and and Devin Booker, I feel good about winning a basketball game. And if I win a basketball game today and I win three more in the next six days, seven days, I won the series. And if I win one series, and I win another series, and I win another series, where am I at, Joel? Where okay. do I sit? Okay, you're real adamant about this. Give me a path right now. What seed they start with? With what seed they enter the playoffs with? Who they play and who they beat in the first round? And maybe I'll start listening to you. Okay. So you look at Phoenix. The pathway is simple. It's simple. When you construct it. You're hoping that somehow in this topsy turvy thing we call life. Oh my God. It's so simple that you're stalling. That the Suns match up with one of the Lakers or the Warriors, and our stars are more healthy than your stars. And what they just seed, run. What seed would Listen, that take? It's impossible, okay? It's impossible. But gosh dang it, we're looking for dark horses, Joel. Yeah. We're going. We're going the length of the board. How about this here, one? Man. How about this one? Los Angeles Lakers. Um, and that's just a bank on LeBron and AD. So, well, some would. Argue, that's a good dark horse. Some would argue 16, that was, 16 wins from LeBron and AD. Some would argue that's a dark horse if their first round matchup is the Thunder. Please. No. <laughs> that was the argument last year, wasn't it? It was. It was. And, I'm and, not and, saying and, I'm some. And all kidding, all kidding aside, I, I I do think that that's the most interesting game in the regular season, is how the Thunder look against Los Angeles because they're a team that matches up particularly well with OKC and and did so last year as well. But that matchup's changed. I mean, I mean the Thunder are completely different, even though um the their core is intact. And then my yeah. last one would be, of course, not parroting Memphis would be Golden State just because of Steph. Like if Steph just is incredible, maybe, but. The thing is, I, I just don't foresee, to, to tie it together, I don't foresee anyone except for Oklahoma City, Dallas, Denver, Minnesota winning the West. And really of that list, I think it's Oklahoma City that's going to come out of it. I, I, I think it's going to be chalk in the West and in the East. Yeah, no, agreed. Well, it, it's, I was thinking about Golden State the other night. Are they closer to missing the playoffs? Then They have to be closer to missing the playoffs than 
Yeah. I, I, matter of fact, I shouldn't even ask the question. I, I would feel. I mean, when you're in the play-in. Question. When you're in the play-in. That's... When you're in the play-in, what? When you're in the play-in, you're you're closer. By the to... way, okay, are we talking about? Right. That's what. That's why I, I retracted the question. But are, are we talking about? Winning the Western Conference in the regular season or coming out of the West to represent the Western? We're talking about coming out of the Western Conference. Yeah, well, neither applies to them, but. Of course. Yeah. I apologize for the Suns rant. I do. I'm glad. It's been a long long time since I've gotten really revved up. I just want to get revved up a little bit. Sometimes you just want to feel things, Joel. Yeah. Starting to feel feel like a player pod. Starting okay. to feel like that one player pod. <laughs> Listen, so, some have called me the the um, you know most gritty player in the media runs. Taking screen, really? taking uh, yeah, I mean taking charges, setting screen assists, things like that. Yeah, but, well, the idea of you is like Edie. You're getting up the floor slow, so you are setting yeah. drag screens. Yeah, sure. that's right. That's right. Yeah, After Edie that, and, I, mean, I mean, uh, Edie in theory, but Joel, who's your who's your dark horse pick for the for the NBA Finals again? For the finals, uh, coming out of the West or like generally? Yeah, just remind me of the West real quick, and then we'll go general. Well, I I was when I said Grizzlies, I meant regular season. I don't think they will make the finals. Yeah, I I think this is a year we should be exempt from a dark horse to make the final. Yes, yeah, it's not a thing. Regular season though, I yeah. think the Grizzlies could. They're a dark horse to win the, the get the first seed. Yeah, I mean, be a fantastic regular season team, a la them Hawks. Remember, them, remember them Hawks team? Don't compare them to that, to that Hawks team. Kidding. Come on, don't do that. Just don't do that, man. Uh, Nasty, the, the nastiest assortment of all stars we've ever seen, by the way. Um, listen, Eastern Conference though, I think is interesting because of the Porzingis factor, because of it's hard to repeat factor, but also because like, okay, if if we if we say that these things are going against Boston, who do you want to hit your wagon to? I mean, the the grimy New York Knicks, the unhealthy. Somewhat inconsistent playoff disappearing act, Philadelphia. Giannis, like who? Who would you hit your wagon to out east if not Boston? If I told you you could not pick Boston, oh the Knicks for sure. I think are are we, are we doing a segment on a dark horse NBA title? Or are we just bundling yeah. that? Yeah, this is it. This? this is it, buddy. Oh, it's the Knicks. The Knicks are that good to me, man. I think they'll give Boston a run for their money. I'm not saying they'll win, but I think they'll play them closer than just about anybody, man. I mean, Jalen Brunson is that. He's really difficult to scheme for. Um, they they have two of the best perimeter defenders in basketball. Um, so matchup-wise, there's a lot they could do. Julius Randle, um, I imagine he just has to send people toward them or toward the rim, um, where Mitchell Robinson – will lie assuming he's healthy um they can play different ways man they can play julius at the five um they can have og defend bigger above his way i mean we saw him defend and beat fairly well in scenarios last year i'm just pretty in on their versatility the chemistry is obviously there with the the whole nova boys thing um and they have like a top three assortment of role players in the league right now like i mean you got on the list and they're they're deep. I mean, Josh Hart is like down on that list. Like in terms of guys that are gonna play second fiddle to to you know Jalen Brunson and I guess Julius Randle if he's back to being an all NBA player. I mean, you're looking at OG and Anobi, Mikael Bridges, Dante DiVincenzo, Josh Hart, Mitchell Robinson. The list goes on and on. Like it's a really good team, uh, and that's any year. So that's my I I, I don't know. Can we call them a, a dark horse for the NBA title? I mean, it, it feels like it's it's the teams in the West mm. and Boston, yeah. and anybody outside of that is a dark horse. So, I mean, you, I mean, my criteria for MVP was top three. If if we use that same criteria, it's Boston, Oklahoma City, Denver, and then Philadelphia, and then you get to New York. And so, like, I I, mean, I, would, I, I, I have no, I don't have Philly over New York. That's yeah. to me. Do you have Denver over New York? I think it depends on matchups because obviously if, if I have, I have New York over Denver for the simple fact of New York has I mean, New York to get to the conference finals, much easier. The path path is easier. Yeah. No, the, 
no matter what the standings are, much easier yeah, path because I firmly believe that they'll be on the opposite side of Boston. Yeah, Denver they'll be there. And, and, and if, and if Boston has one seed and they have a much harder task to get to the West Finals than yeah, New York does, no debate. And 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 if Boston, if 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 New York gets there to the conference finals, which I imagine they will, uh, ninety percent sure. If Boston has bad injury timing, they're in the finals probably. Yeah. With Denver, I, I mean, you, if you Boston has a couple clunkers in the Garden. They're in the New York's in the finals. Like the, the the sport of basketball when New York is at its apex is better. Like the, the the garden being on fire is better for the sport. And it's hard to repeat. And you have you're already entering the, the, the season with the Porzingis equation. I like New York. I like New York a lot. Me too. But man. I'm okay, who, who, who's I'm, yours? I'm here. Uh, I'm getting there, Joel. I mean, this is podcasting, babe. We're gonna figure this out one day for you about the rhythmic <laughs> but the rhythmic dance that is podcasting. I cannot quit Philadelphia. I can't quit them. I, I can't quit them. It's a habit I cannot break. Every year I do this for myself. It's it's partly the Kansas thing with Embiid. It's partly the fact I love watching Sixer games. Broadcast crew's fantastic. They tip off at six. I get to watch them a little earlier uh, than whenever the Thunder and, and the West Conference pick, uh, tips off. I love Philadelphia. And if you can go back hand to God in the year of our 2024, I, I believe every single podcast I've done on Lockdown Thunder for postseason previews, I've picked Philadelphia. And every single time I get burned because I'm an idiot, Joel. Yeah, you've but, lost all your fingers by now. But dang it, Joel. Dang it. Am I ready to bet on Philadelphia again? Maxi, Paul George, Embiid, my guy, Jared McCain. I'm, oh. I'm a sixer. I'm a sixer. They, they have all your favorite content on the team, your favorite podcast, your favorite TikToker. They got I mean, everybody. Listen, elite Twitter and Joel, and Joel uh, Embiid, elite name, by the way. Uh, you have Maxi, fine on social media, whatever. The best TikToker in the league, in in, uh, in in Jared McCain, the best podcaster in the league, which is a which is a a medium near and dear to my heart. Clearly, so I think a heck of a coach who, who hails they, from the G League, a very important part of my life as well. So I can add your favorite player, Kyle Lowry, too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Look, this is what I this is what I'll say about Philly. I want to bet on them too, but I am not so dumb that I keep going back to the person that hurt me. I'm, not, as I'm not dumb, and it's really cost me in the past. They're blinded well, by well, love. Personally, personally, it's done that. Professionally, it's done that. Listen, we can really get to the to, to the therapy couch right now of how many times I've gone back to uh, bad vices, so to say, and Philadelphia yeah. is one of them. And I'm, Philadelphia, and I'm, accept and I'm me as a sixer. I'm, it's going to be done, Philly Robin. Phoenix. Philly Phoenix, Joel. You're disgusting. If I, if I was to fall back into that slump, go back to the vices, as you say. I mean, you've got a, it would you've be, got a trio it would, here that could I, pull the rug out from you at any any moment. You might anyway, it, it, would, it would be because of Maxi, and not because of Paul George, who at this stage isn't giving me any indication that But what if this is the perfect setup? What if this is the perfect center for Paul George? You know, I was, and it and it could be, but I would still be betting on this thing because of Maxi and not him. And and the thing is, you know, I think this is the. I'll say this: I think this is their, the second best shot they've had, with Embiid at the helm. I obviously the best shot was the year that that they still had peak Ben Simmons. They had Jimmy Butler. They lost to Kawhi on a game winner in Game Seven. Like that's tragic. It's life. It's basketball. This is the best shot they've had since then, and I don't know it's particularly close with the assortment of role players they have, um, with Martin, with Paul George possibly in this role, with your guy Kyle Lowry, with with Jared McCain. This is the best shot MB's had. I just don't know that that's enough when you look at the top two teams in this conference, barring any injuries. I would bet. I would have bet on the Knicks without adding Mikael Bridges. You know, I would have bet on the Knicks adding Mikael Bridges without Julius Randle coming back. Like, there are combinations of the Knicks without being at full yeah. force. I love New York. needs to count them in before I would Philly. I'm sorry. I, I just – I can't keep betting on Philly, man. I can't. Is this a hot take? Eastern Conference, no longer the ugly redheaded stepchild of the NBA. Because, I mean – I love Boston. I love Philadelphia. I love New York. We're we have not mentioned Giannis Antetokounmpo playing with Dame Lillard. Like, That's Dame's fault. 
we haven't mentioned for- Cleveland. Who like I don't think can win the NBA Finals. I don't think can win. The, I don't think they can win the East. I don't think they can do anything relevant. But you know what they can do? Give you a tough six games, steal yeah. a first round series, beat you up, not let you get to your goals. Or I think Orlando could do the same. I like the Orlando middle could of the do the East. same. I like the middle of the East. I'm a fan. I don't the NBA. Think it's a hot take. This is peak NBA. This is peak NBA right here. This is peak NBA. Well, yeah, you, you, cut the nostalgia. You, cut the nostalgia. No, you're this probably is, right. Hey, I'm not a nostalgia yeah. merchant. You're a nostalgia merchant out of the two of us. Uh, I do I do uh, dabble in Jerry Stackhouse highlights from time to time. You're a sicko. And, and Brandon Bass. and Oh, Brandon uh, Bass was sweet, man. Oh, my goodness. Don't get me started on Brandon Bass. I'd love to do yeah, Locked On least. Brandon Bass. I bet you would. You Locked On Kyle Lowry. You, you're just a nostalgia merchant. Where does merchant. Kyle Lowry love come from? That's your guy. Okay. Okay. I'll take it. Don't, okay. You're a nostalgia merchant between the two of us. I like the current NBA. I'm I'm of the belief, and this is why we're not, we're not going to get into the whole barbershop Bron versus MJ thing. I'm not mad when people call MJ the goat, but basketball is. I mean, evolution is a big part of life, man. And the basketball players that play today are the most capable basketball players we've ever seen. So I, I won't disagree with you, Joel. This has been awesome. This has been awesome. I'm going to have to do some editing magic. So you're going to get some of this in a podcast Tuesday, some of it in Wednesday. It's going to be shuffled around from how we recorded it. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and it's going to be a lot of work to put together, but it was fun, Joel. Go to Twitter at JX Lorenzi to find Joel. Joel, what are you cooking up over there at the Oklahoman? Well, it's pretty dry right now. I need people to send me mailbag questions so I can make my people happy here at the Oklahoman because it is just – when people said this is the worst month of the NBA season – I think it went in one year out the other. Oh, it did. You, in fact, called me an idiot whenever I told you that back in June. Uh, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Did but happen. for it to be this dry, I mean, damn. It's like I, I feel like I'm the last person on earth sometimes. There's absolutely nothing going on with player pods. And, hey, I'm not writing about a player pod. Although some have said that your uh, hotline bling has never been more on fire than it is right Brian, now. Brian, do you mind? <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Uh, maybe we'll have a special announcement here the next time you join us to officially lock in, but uh, we could do it now. But we'll, we might tease that and wait for a future pod. Joel, thanks for joining us at JX Lorenzi on Twitter. Until next time, be good and be good to 